Freed, and we are back in the uh, belly of the Williams Center. Um, and William Carlos Williams would probably uh, be excited today because I'm actually interviewing uh, a novelist, a satirist, humorist, uh, Aaron McLaughlin. Welcome. Thanks. We already met, but hi again. <laughs> well, today is the, the meeting day, yeah? Yes. Or we met before this. Maybe we have no, we crossed paths like before? No, I met like 20 minutes ago. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We already said hi, but hi again. For sure, for <laughs> sure. And she is here because she has just uh, released her uh, debut novel? Yeah. The Lobster Heist. Yes. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, so you're, you're hanging out in New York City around there now? Yeah, I live in Astoria, but I'm going to be moving to Brooklyn soon. Nice. Uh, I'm becoming the people I satirize, I guess, but I have to move for work, so well, that's yeah, the only you're, reason. You're either in on the joke or you are the joke. I know. And I feel I'm like a, we just go back and forth. <laughs> I'm a Queens gal, but, you know, that's you, what it is. Did you grow up there? No, no, I grew up in Westchester, okay, cool. um, New York. Nice. So, but like not a rich part of Westchester, but then I moved to Queens because I was doing a lot of satire and stuff. So Astoria and, um, sorry, not satire, stand up and Astoria was really close to Manhattan. So definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess as a satirist, you are Astoria. No, that oh was, wow! That was, that that's was a good. Pun. That's good. That's good. Sorry, yeah, you're yeah. the right. You're the writer. I'm the, <laughs> I'm the interviewer. Hell yeah, you're a writer. You're, you do comedy. No, I definitely do comedy. How well I do it is uh, left to be up to the imagination. But oh, enough yeah. about me. <laughs> <laughs> so, what was it like growing up in Westchester? Do you um, want to say what town you grew up in, or does it not well, matter? Well, I grew up in Thornwood. Then I moved to Pleasantville. Thornwood was a very Italian American area. I found out last night I'm six percent Italian. So. It now makes sense. But then I moved to Pleasantville my sophomore year of high school, which was a very kind of ritzy, snobby town with a lot of um, indie people. And yeah. when I got into satire later on, um, I wrote for The Hard Times slash still pitch to The Hard Times, which is a punk music or just music satire website. You know The yeah. Hard Times? Oh, no, no. I yeah, know yeah. about it a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's yeah. super cool. Yeah. How did you get involved with that? Did you just have to submit and they liked your stuff? Or did you, like, know people through other things and then they were like, hey, you're hilarious. Come oh. on board. Yeah, actually, it was funny because I was the... I went to Binghamton University, upstate New York, and Jeremy Kaplowitz of... He was... He just stepped down, but he was the editor-in-chief of Hard Drive, their offshoot... Is that a word? Offshoot? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Offshoot satire site at video games and nerd culture and stuff. He was the editor-in-chief of the satirical newspaper at Binghamton. Uh -huh. And then a few years later, so was I. So then through mutual connections, I kind of knew him. Um, and then I pitched the uh, hard drive. I got in. And then I pitched to Hard Times and said, oh, I'm in Hard Drive. I know Jeremy and whatever. And they accepted me. And I jumped up and down in my room. I was so excited. I was in college back then. And like... You still had excitement. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. I'm pretty apathetic now. But I, I was really excited. And that's kind of where it took off with actual published satire. So, but anyway, the point was I would satirize a lot of people from that Pleasantville town who are very indie music, whatever, mm. like assholes to women, blah, blah, blah. Here I am doing it again. But <laughs> <laughs> no hate. I've moved on with my life. But where I grew up did influence my music tastes and my subsequent satire, so... Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Like you do reference Pleasantville in the book, so uh, yes. that's that is nice to give it a little a little so. Yeah, I think I said um, they sucked the dick of Kurt Vonnegut's dick, the ghost dick of Kurt Kurt Vonnegut, or something like that. Yeah, no, it uh, sounds like a place I would live now. Yeah. Oh no, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't hate, I don't I don't dislike Kurt Vonnegut, but maybe I and I don't dislike Marxism, but I like there's a lot of people who are like, oh yeah, communist manifesto, oh Kurt Vonnegut, the 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 the. I wear a feminist patch on my jacket, but I hate women, you know that yeah, type. Yeah, for sure. No, I feel like. Your book definitely, not to like read too much into you from your book, mm -hmm. but it feels like 
there is an appreciation for the hipster culture yeah. along with the like shitting on hipster culture like yeah. they're like the, yeah once again the if you can't beat them join them kind of a thing like yeah. we like we just live in this era that we live in and we have to adhere to these codes <laughs> like, right right and this culture yeah yeah no i actually wrote the book when i was like so I actually saw, I was going to a hard times meetup in the city and I went to this, uh, I was just waiting around hungry. I went to this hot dog place called Criff Dogs. Do you know it? I don't. No. Yeah. Well, it's basically like the hot dog place I described in the book. Um, <laughs> very small kind of hipster has like Pac-Man machines. It was in Williamsburg and it closed, but they have a different location. But anyway, I was waiting there for the satire event. And then there was a guy who said, um, he picked up the phone and he said, city morgue, how can I help you? And like, I ended up writing a whole scene on that and then just left it alone. I was like, it was like one of the, f my favorite things I wrote. Like I submitted it to like, you know, creative writing classes that you had to apply to and stuff. And then I was like, oh, I'm struggling to write a book. And then my friend Paloma, who I mentioned in the dedication was like, you should keep writing the one about the hot dog place. And I was like, yeah, whatever. And then a few years later, I started writing it and it just felt really right. And then like the, that was probably 2020. Well, I was like 23 at the time. And then the pandemic hit, so I finished writing it during the pandemic. So anyway, point being is that I'm 26 now and I've, inched away from music culture and stuff but back then it was really prevalent in my life huh. so that's why I kind of satirized it and I think now my interests are more in like work culture and unions and satirizing corporate America and stuff so I think my next book is going to be more broad nice. um, but yeah so anyway the point was that I was closer to those things and I think with satire it really Good satire really comes from like knowing the experience and knowing the culture. Like for hard times if, or sometimes like hard drive, I don't have as much experience with video game culture and stuff other than my friends and like Animal Crossing. So <laughs> I would struggle to write articles because I didn't understand the satirical target as much as I do like music and stuff. Hard drive's great. I'm just like, don't understand that culture as much. So it was harder to write. I only had one published article with them, but it was harder to write or with Hard Times or any other publication. If I didn't know the target as well, it just like did not flow naturally and it's harder. So that's why I satirized all those things. Wow. Yeah. So what what do you mean by you were involved in like the music culture? Do you play an instrument or do you, you were just very into like going to concerts all the time and like who the newest band was? Mm -hmm. Well, when I was 15, I moved to Pleasantville and there was a big like indie music culture there and stuff. And then somebody who I actually dedicated the book to Shane Howe, who passed away, but uh, he was my ex-boyfriend and he was also then after that a good friend. Um, and he introduced me to folk punk music and indie music and stuff like that. So then I got really into that. I had a folk punk phase and I had, mm. you know, indie music phase. Um, and so I would go to a lot of indie basement shows and stuff. And then when I was 20, I don't know, maybe 1920, my best friend and I were like, yeah, these people treat us like, not people, the girls are great. But the guys at the time we were like, yeah, they kind of treat us really shitty. And then I started to realize the flaws in the indie basement culture and you know stuff like that so that's kind of how it led me to like music culture and satirizing that cool yeah, yeah no or it's like independent coffee shops yada yada sorry yeah no it's yeah. funny because like that's just a world of people who they do work hard but don't want to yes. work like they want to play their art and right. now it's like you're moving over to labor so i think that's yeah. that's very convenient also labor day Oh, nice. So this is a good interview. Yes, it is. They're, well timed. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I don't think that about all people in music. And I think a lot, like, I have so many friends who are still in bands and play instruments and whatever who are extremely talented. And some come from that town, Pleasantville, or like most of them do. Um, 
So yeah, definitely doesn't apply to all. But I think you see in a lot of indie music scenes that same culture and same with stand up too, where women are kind of put down by a lot of yeah. narcissistic men. Yeah, I don't really understand why that permeates the culture so hard. Yeah. I think like, because stand up is a very ego based art form. And yeah. even for me, the reason I stopped doing stand up was because I used to like to write funny things and write comedic fiction, which I've been doing since I was like 11 years old, just because I like to have the power to influence people to laugh or smile or stuff like that. And then when I was doing stand up, it became more, I want people to think I'm funny instead of, yeah. I want people to laugh. And when you're writing, you you are still very vulnerable, but you're you don't literally have a spotlight on you and you're standing on yeah. stage. And I'm sure you know how it feels to like say a joke and it just doesn't go well. And it's like, oh, damn, like that. It just sucks. The feeling sucks. So the point is that myself included, it does draw people with insecurities and ego issues and maybe addictions and stuff like that. So when you have those personalities, I think just men... They are not all men. Not all men. <laughs> Hashtag not all men. They, that can happen where women are put yeah. down. But also women can put each other down too. It's just like the personality type yeah. that draws you to being a performer, I think, can often have narcissism or something people have a chip on their shoulder they feel yeah. like they were, they were slighted by somebody and then the person they were slighted by all of a sudden becomes their art and they right take carry that in the world like guys don't have women sleep with them and then they hate women for the rest of yeah. their lives yeah yeah then, but not yeah. not all I, I have a lot of friends who are male stand-up comics who are really nice people i met, I met a few that yeah. are okay yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah it depends uh what open mic you go to i guess if you go to like a lot of bringer mics, which for people who don't know, that means that you have to pay to perform or you have to bark, yeah. which is like standing outside, probably in the cold, begging people to come to a comedy show. I think those shows where you're guaranteed to get on stage and yada yada, I understand how it's easy to fall for. Um, but yeah, you probably see more of those like personalities there. Yeah, it's just like... I don't mean to hate. I don't know if you do bringer mics. I'm sorry. Uh, no, I'm like very against bringers. I'm pretty against like charging people for open mics. Like $5 has kind of become the norm. I feel like yeah. all over that that's just like acceptable. And like I get the $5 because if you're if it's free, maybe there's 45 people who come out and yeah. maybe that's too many people. And like by putting some kind of price tag on it, then yeah. like you weed out some people. But like the bringer thing is like so problematic because it's just like if somebody could bring 10 people to a show then they should just be doing their own show yeah. unless they're an amateur and mm -hmm. if they're an amateur then they shouldn't be doing comedy shows yeah so then it's just like well what are they are they actually amateurs or are they actually professionals and then yes. it's like they're making people laugh at this bringer show so does that make them a professional they're making people laugh at an open mic does that make them a professional no yeah. like if people don't even know comedy is happening and then you make them laugh you are a comedian, you know? Yeah. So, like, I, I think there's a lot of, like, issues just, like, with the egos, once again, because, like, uh -huh. everybody's very protective of their spots and, like, yes. their clout and their power that, like, it makes it very hard to just be, like, I like writing. Yes. I like performing. Yes. I like making people laugh because, like, yeah. that is what comedy is to me. Like, yeah. when somebody is, like... Sorry, buddy, like, you're gonna have to do this show at Scotty's in fucking Springfield, New Jersey, and you're gonna have to bring eight people. It's like, bro, why do I have to bring eight people to Scotty's in yeah. New Jersey? Is it a comedy club or is it not a comedy club? Right. Are you selling comedy or are you not selling comedy? Yeah. What are you guys doing all the time to that I have to bring yeah. people, you know? like That's very that's Not to, like, true. gang up on Scotty's because every single New York City comedy club does that shit. Yeah. But, like, there's, like, independent bookers who are like, I could be hot shit. I could book a show here. Yeah. Hey, all of you new comics bring eight people and then you have an audience of 64 people and it's like oh my gosh i did such a great job pat on the back yeah. and it's like these comics like may not even be a comic in five weeks you yeah. know and then it's just like i agree yeah i don't know i'm about the culture like yeah. i'm about like i want to write jokes and yes. i want to like 
be around people who are making new stuff all the time. Yes. I don't want to hear the same five minutes all the time because it's like, there is pressure to be funny every mm-hmm. single time you go on stage. And if mm-hmm. you are not funny, then we will never book you ever again. <laughs> yeah, I agree. That's why I'm more drawn to satire writing yeah. than comedic fiction. No, that's super cool. And I feel like it's a little bit of a dying art as somebody who's like, kind of dabbled in satire and dabbled in like fiction in general like people just don't like to read as much as they used to i think i think it's coming back though i used to think the same thing but i think since the pandemic i think people have probably taken up to reading more maybe it'll fade but i mean you always have mcsweeney's which is really popular or the uh daily shouts and the new yorker and and all that so i think for satirical websites, definitely it's a bad time because Facebook cracks down on fake news advertising. Um, like when when I was the head editor of Jumpkick, a site that I co-founded with my friend Peter, um, like we struggled with that. You get a lot more likes on Instagram than Facebook, huh. but I think Facebook cracking down on supposed fake news or like not favoring the algorithm towards satire has really impacted website clicks. Like I used to see the onion within five minutes, get a hundred thousand likes. Now it's like 100 maybe, but I think satire is really important because it targets issues in society. And Scott Dickers, who was the founding editor of the onion, he wrote, he has a book called how to write funnier. And he said, And I would highly recommend it. It's really good. Um, He said that satire is something to, um, what is it? Afflict afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. So. Wow. That's, that's trippy. I like that a lot. It's deep. It's like, I just graduated um, and I created from grad school. Um, And I got my degree in corporate communication. I realized very soon into it that I hate corporate America. (laughs) And, um, but I met a lot of great people there and I learned a lot. But I created a satire website for my capstone about corporate America. So my goal in that was to like um, satirize things about work cultures or companies not caring or whatever. So that's kind of like... um, afflict the comfortable and then comfort the employees who feel that way. Nobody at my capstone presentation understood what I was doing. Like they looked really weirded out and confused, not Uh. in like a, Oh, I'm so great. You guys are dumb. A Rick and Morty type of way. But like in a, they were like, what the fuck is she doing? (laughs) (laughs) So I was like kind of embarrassed, but it's, it's whatever. It's like a Wix link that has a really long, amateur url so so it's hard to find are you trying to not let people know about it or do you want people to know well, about it i'm thinking about like we were just talking about like websites satire websites not doing well so a part of me doesn't want to add to it but in theory i would love to have writers involved and writing satire articles on work culture and corporate america because i think it's really really important to highlight yeah. those issues, especially because you see so many memes and TikToks and reels about making fun of corporate America and stuff. So it's a hot topic right now. So I'm thinking about, in theory, expanding it. But like I said, it's just very hard to get a website, satire website off the ground. Yeah. Well, there's I think so you, many. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's just tough for every... Uh artist publication because there's Mm -hmm. just too much available right now so Mm -hmm. it really is about being like niche content and really like cracking into who knows you what is your Mm -hmm. audience where does your audience live and all that stuff but yeah i think a lot of people have come around to the fact that like some people get paid 99 percent of the profits and do one percent of the work yeah and it's like why are they getting 99% of the profits without doing 99% of the work? Yes. And it's like, that is an issue in our society that is tenfold and everybody experiences it where they're just like, 
what the hell? Like, I come to work every day at, like, weird hours, and I never see my boss. And yeah. they get to make money, and they're just chilling. They have families, and I just fucking live in an apartment that I can't afford. And yeah, it's like, I agree. Why, does it, why does everybody get integrity of life except, like, the five people I work with, you know? And then you go yeah. to every business, and you're like, oh, wow, this is literally the same across every job I've worked in. Yeah. And I'm like, wow, these people <laughs> who are at the top don't even realize that like we're barely getting by and yes, that's like I agree. all this stuff like i say this i now work at uh, an arts organization so we yeah. have a little bit different miss- mission besides getting rich but yes. like when you work for a for-profit business i agree then like they should be doing all of the work if you sell sneakers then the person who owns the company should do something in making sneakers I they agree. should not just outsource all of the sneaker uh-huh. making to everybody else because then you're just literally a nothing person, which is what a lot of business in corporate America is. It's oh, just yeah. like nothing people just sending emails and putting off things <laughs> and spending money and being like, it'll work next quarter. Yeah. Just keep spending money. It'll work next quarter. <laughs> yeah, we, we buy things and trade things and stuff. Yeah, I, I work in the public sector now, so I'm a lot happier there, but... And definitely, I think for satire, and I did this in the book too, a lot, like drawing on your past experiences to inform what you're writing, and you never know if it could help somebody else. So that's why I love satire and comedic fiction as well. Oh, yeah. Like, I just specificity is just something I've been learning is very important. Because mm-hmm. I feel like when you're starting out as an artist, everybody's like, Nobody cares about you. Nobody cares what you have to say. Who the fuck cares? And then yeah. that makes artists become very generic. Yes. But if you ignore the, nobody cares about that, give up. Like, stop talking about that. Yeah. And, like, just talk about what you think is important. I think eventually the right people find you. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. What, what were you reading, like, growing up and, like, more in your teen years when you were, like, reading, starting to read, like, adult stuff? Yeah, I mean, I was always kind of a mature kid. I My satire life or writing life started when I, I read the book Twilight and I hated it. <laughs> and so I typed in on Google, like, Twilight sucks. And I found this website called twilightsucks.com or something. <laughs> and everybody talked about why it sucked through a writing lens. Um, so ironically, Twilight, which I think is one of the worst books ever... Uh, no offense, Stephanie Meyer. I think she's a bad person or something. But um, that kind of sparked my love for satire. <laughs> and I learned a lot because people were talking about Mary Sue's and Gary Stews, which means like a character who's very one dimensional. Uh, um, so I just learned a lot about the writing craft that way. But then when I got into college and stuff, or I think when I was in high school, I read some Kurt Vonnegut. Um, and Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and stuff. And then when I went to college, I got really into early American literature. I think nice. it's early or late or one of the two. No, I think like I just Poe got or into... something else? No, no. After um, Poe. Raymond before... Carver oh, okay, was cool. one yeah. of those. <laughs> yeah, that was a lot that later. Era, yeah. But Raymond Carver, Tobias Wolfe, um, Henry James... Because I had somebody, this, this is going to make me sound really conceited, but somebody in a creative writing class in, at Binghamton said, your writing style reminds me of a mix between Raymond Carver and Henry James, probably because I'm very dry and minimalist and I love long sentences with M dashes. <laughs> um, so then I really honed in on reading those two authors and trying to learn from them. So I really like minimalist fiction. Because I am, I struggle with this now, like, I am terrible at imagery and symbolic language and stuff, so I kind of write in a more robotic way sometimes, but I try to make it funny. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's it's weird, because, like, you look at, like, Raymond Carver type stuff, and you're just like, this is a guy just writing, and he's just like, I'm not going to tell you how to feel. Just, exactly. just show up. Just it's, show up and read it, you know? No, it's true. He'll be like, the kitchen table. And I'm like, oh my God, that means so much, you know? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. He just, he, he really finds a way to spark emotions despite using almost no flowery language. Yeah. And I think that's great. And that's how I like to write. But I'm trying to 
branch out a little more and do more metaphors and yada 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 but I like writing in a very dry way with humor infused into that yeah I was gonna say do you think when you write minimalistically do you think it's tougher for people to understand your humor I hope not was it <laughs> no no, no I yeah. no I thought yeah I thought the book was very funny and Thank I like you. I really enjoyed it like we'll we'll definitely talk more about it um but I just like even text messages, like I'll send text messages oh, sometimes yeah. to people and they won't understand them and they'll be like, what, what do you mean by that? And yes. I was like, I'm making a joke, chill out. <laughs> like I'm not, not trying to start something yeah. <laughs> over text message. Like that's not how I live my life to start I, things. Tonality, you know? tonality is hard. But yeah. yeah, I think that's definitely even in, a struggle. Even in college, I wrote this short story about, uh, that was based off of like me and one of my buddies like hiking in high school. And, yeah. like, we lived right off of the Appalachian Trail. Oh. So, like, nice. we had, like, we were just doing a day hike one day, and mm -hmm. we were coming down, and some guy was, like, rolling cigs, and nice. he was, like, a thru-hiker who had come from Georgia, and he was all the way up in New York already. Wow. So I was like, oh, this guy seems interesting, and he was like... We, we got lost and we were like, oh, do you know how to get down the hill? Like, do you know how to get out of the hike? Because, like, we were fucking 17 or 18. Like, we don't, we haven't done it that many times that we're like, oh, it's obvious. You just follow the white. Like, yeah. we were being stupid. And he was like, oh, no, like, I'm a through hiker. And we were like, what? Oh, cool. And then all of a sudden he was like, hey, can you give me a ride to Greenwood Lake? My buddies are going to meet me there. And we're like 17 and we're like, yeah, let's just pick up this random dude oh from out of town. Yeah. And then we were like, oh, but we're getting ice cream. You want to come get ice cream? And we picked him up and brought him to get ice cream. <laughs> nice. So, like, my short story was like, what if that guy was just like, take up your clothes and yeah. like, go on the lake? Yeah. And it's like, I'm taking your car. Yeah. And just like, I'm leaving you stranded. Yeah. <laughs> and. The one main thing that somebody was very much critiquing was, like, how sexist the boys were. And I was like, they're high school boys. Like, I was just writing them as, like, stupid high school boys who would get, right. like, tricked by, like, a hiker guy. Yeah. But it's, like, it's so different than talking. Like, it is, when you talk yeah. to somebody, they actually hear your tone of voice. Right. No, that's a good point. I mean, satire can easily be misconstrued. So I always try in my headlines to be like, I'm going to make sure I'm not offensive or touch any, well, sensitive topics, sure, not just like I try and keep a 10 foot pole's length away from certain things um, that could potentially offend or hurt people because that's not my intention because it's hard I think for people for people who are sat satirists or comedians they'll probably get it but you can't guarantee that everybody's gonna get it and somebody might misconstrue the satirical target like it sounds like yours could have been misconstrued by somebody. Oh, yeah. Criticism. And she might have been right, too. Might have just yeah. been bad. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I get it. It's, it's hard. Um, dry humor. But I, I also agree with that, like, in stand-up. Like, mm -hmm. it is good to stay far away from topics <laughs> that you have no business talking about. Right. You know, like, some people are like, this is a muscle that I want to start pumping. Oh, and I'm like, God. why do you want to pump that muscle? Just <laughs> pump the brakes instead. And, like... Yeah chill and talk about things that people actually want to hear you as a human talk about. Oh, yeah. There are things that I don't want to hear you as a human talk about, but I would hear that person as a human talk about, mm -hmm. you know? It's like I, knowing yeah. your audience and your own character. I think The Onion does that really well, where they satirize the human condition, which sounds yeah. really snobby, but like they had an article that I don't want to butcher the headline, but um, it was like a uh, friend forcing you to play board games or board games explanation board game explanation from friends peppered with reassurances that it'll be fun <laughs> something like that yeah. or like a man assumes garlic is minced enough just like those everyday things i think somebody to have an eye for that that's something i struggle with like i can think of satire for general concepts but thinking of it for like very specific moments or like that's what I struggle with it's hard it's hard yeah. to view it that way from a like more narrow day-to-day -day lens that's why Jerry Seinfeld makes a lot of money yeah he's like he is the king of like boring shit being <laughs> kind of interesting <laughs> yeah that's a good way to describe him yeah um so when did you know that you were going to be a novelist? Was it like more of a question of when? Yeah, so I would write 
novels on this website called Booksy. Okay. And I was a big fan of iCarly growing up, so a lot of the characters were just complete ripoffs of all the iCarly characters. But they were like, they were like, I also watched The Secret Life of an American Teenager. Do you know that? A little bit. Yeah. It was like about a teen pregnancy and stuff. So I would have things infused, like, and Degrassi, like, I would have things infused to these iCarly character ripoffs lives, like, drugs and <laughs> alcohol and teen pregnancy and whatever but like the characters were based on iCarly anyway so that profile is still up and all those ridiculous stories I have are still up and the funny thing is there's a line in this book and a previous book I wrote that are like she had black hair a black scarf and most likely black shoes or something and I actually one time I was reading through my old writing just for fun, being like, wow, that's so stupid, that sentence is dumb, just like finding it funny. And then I saw that exact line was used when I was like 11 years old. And uh, I wow. was blown away by that because I'm like, so I guess my brain still thinks the same, like in that repetition sense. But anyway, so I've been writing novels since I was like 11, 12. Um, and I took a break for a while for like, probably two years from the end of high school because I had a lot of struggles until I was a sophomore in college because I took a creative writing class and really got back into it. Um, but yeah, I, I told myself, I said to myself like five years ago, I'm going to publish a novel by the time I'm 26. Wow. Like I'm going to do it. And then it ended up happening. So that was very cool. It is. Yeah, yeah, it's super cool. Yeah. Uh, uh, I was kicked off my mom's health insurance, but I published a book, so that's good. Hey, yeah. you got to pay for Obamacare somehow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, what happened to those, like, with those novels, you just self-published online, or it was just, like, mm -hmm. chapter format for the stories? Yeah, I Or guess... have you been published, like, have you had a book, a physical book before? Is this the first physical book? No, I did write a book... Like I told myself again before I graduated my undergrad, I said, by the time I graduate, I'm going to write a full book. And so for like a year and a half, I was writing a book and it was based on a lot of my experiences and funny and bad experiences that I had in college and kind of an ode to like all the friends that I met and all the lessons I learned. But the day before I graduated, I finished that book. And I submitted it places and blah, blah, blah. But then I realized it's not, one, nobody wanted it. Two, I think it kind of sucked. Three, um, I realized like it's a, it was so personal and so based on my life that, and so was this book a lot. But that one was a little too specific. And I was like, I'm going to just use that book as a lesson and as a healing book to kind of heal and process like the bad things and then also just like give an ode to all the good things. Um, so I kept that book to myself and then I just learned the lessons I did from it to inform how I write now, I guess. Word, yeah. yeah. I, I We were talking earlier, I had a very similar situation and yeah, now now the book is just mine. Yeah, but yep. yeah, it was definitely processing a lot of stuff. I, mm -hmm. I got off Lexapro without weaning off, so maybe uh, maybe that inspired sad. some yeah. of the uh, the writing. Maybe yeah. maybe I was uh, on Lexapro withdrawals yes. when I was writing the entire novel for yes. like a month. Like I basically wrote it in a month. Yeah, wow. <laughs> it was very it was very quick, but um, it's tough. Like, what would you say is your biggest challenge in like writing a novel? Being vulnerable. Um, because this book was really based on my life. Uh, I don't know. Can I go into it? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I'd love yeah. yeah, anything you want to share. Okay. Yeah, well, hopefully my family doesn't listen to this. But anyway, so... And if you do get into spoilers, we could uh, tell people to uh, hit the 30-second forward <laughs> yeah. button or whatever. <laughs> yeah, no, I won't give... I'll just give basically an overview of what's on the back cover. Um, but so, like, when I was young... My family told me my dad was dead and that he was somebody else. And I always suspected it was strange. It was very, they were very like uh, avoidant about talking about it. What was your family then, structure at that point? I was living with my mom and my aunt. Cool. Um, my aunt helped raise me. Like, I really appreciate both of them. 
but this was a traumatic experience. And then when I was 18, they told me that my dad was actually alive and someone else, and he was like a cokehead and had been to jail and he abused my mom. And so at the time I was like, really, I was 17, I was really mad, but at the same time, like my dream came true of having my dad not be dead. And then I tried to find him for like five years um, and I ran into roadblocks every time, like people on Craigslist being like, yeah, I know your dad, but then would refuse to tell me anything oh, like wow. of how to contact him. And then, so that was the basis for that, like feeling an identity crisis growing up about not knowing about my father and, and just being like really confused by the lack of information I got. So a lot of what the protagonist does, like talking about going on ancestry websites, going on information search websites, trying to find his dad and like just having kind of being aimless and having an identity crisis. I went through all that stuff. So it was really healing, but at the same time, very vulnerable because right after I finished the book, somebody reached out to me and said, hey, your dad wants to talk to you like a mutual friend, oh, literally wow. days after finishing the book. And the book was very healing for me. And like, cause of all that vulnerability and everything I put into the Josh character, like all his traumas were my traumas basically, except my mom's still alive, but all of his thank traumas God. were, yeah, thank <laughs> God. Um, and I, I don't mean to diss my family cause I appreciate them, but like the lessons Josh learned I learned, um, but anyway, a few days after I finished the book and like thought, oh, I healed all that trauma. Like, I don't need to know my dad to know who I am. He reaches out to me and he's actually, I don't think he's a bad person, but he's very mentally ill. Um, so he's done a few things where I've had to cut him off probably about five times. Um, and the last time I cut him off was like eight months ago. Um, because he gave out my information to somebody on the internet claiming to be uh, the lead actress of the show NCIS. And I was like, he was like, her name's Erin McLaughlin. She lives in Queens. She's 24 years old. I'm 26. Um, blah, blah, blah. I'm so proud of her, whatever. And the person sent me a screenshot. I think they were trying to like ask me for money or something. And I was like, I flipped out at him like over text because that is crossing so many boundaries and putting my safety at risk. Yeah. But anyway, that's, that's where that comes from. And I think uh, people might find that interesting. It could be a lifetime movie. Hit me up if any agents are listening to that story. But so, yeah, I think the hardest part was just sorting through that trauma and putting it on page. Cause I tend to be more avoidant in talking about my trauma and I repress it. Um, that goes for like all of my traumas and stuff. But, um, so that was hard. It's hard to be vulnerable in writing. So the fact that I could do it, I was like, all right, I can. And I actually, since that, since my dad came into my life and like, I've had to block him a bunch of times and stuff. I just hate talking about my dad or anything to do with it I'm just like I want to move on like I don't want to bring it up but there are some things that you know for all of us aren't fully processed or things that we're never going to fully get over we can move on with our lives but that trauma is still going to be there you just have to learn how to deal with it and get help if you need it get support if you can um but yeah so since then I've like stopped talking about it so I think the book coming out and like going on podcasts or having an event, there's going to be a book launch event at Astoria Bookshop on October 7th. So that'll be promoted soon. Make but sure anyway, you guys go to that yes. New York City people and yes. you can get there yeah. October 7th. Yeah, I think October 6th or 7th, whatever the Friday is. But the point being, I'm doing podcasts, I'm speaking at things or reading my book and like, I'm going to have to start talking about it again, just like I just did. And I think that'll, you know, open the doors to not be as avoidant about it um, since recent events with him had happened. Uh, you know, the NCIS thing. Yeah, wow. Well. At least I got to meet a celebrity. Um, but yeah, I forgot where I was going with that. But yeah, it's going to be a healing experience, I think, again, 
Um, and I was kind of avoiding reading it because I was like, you know, I, I don't want to think about that stuff. And it's been like, um, you know, it's been like two years since I last wrote it. So I'm like, oh God, what if I hate it? Like, what if I don't like the way I wrote something? And, you know, I think I've grown as a writer. So like, what if I hate it or whatever? But today, because we were meeting, I was like, all right, I need to read it. And I read the last 50 pages and it was a, yeah, I'm not going to spoil it, but it was really emotional and I actually cried and it felt really bittersweet. The last 50 pages bangs, like the whole book oh. is very good, but like, yeah, like once we uh, start to get into main territory, it's yeah. like, that's, that's when the book like really has its juice. Yeah. Thank no, you. It, it really, it really Thank earns you. the end. Yeah. I like the end a lot. Thank you. It's, it kind of is like a comedic fiction. Yeah. I remember one of my beta readers who I love told me this that like it's it's funny and absurd and then there's a tone shift when you get to page 50 but they said like it's not you might want to look at it but it's not necessarily bad um and I, I left it because I think I don't know I just left it whatever but I tried to insert jokes in there but I think the last 50 pages I really tapped into all that trauma and vulnerability and then so it was weird given the end of the book uh you know, what I just said, like, overcoming that trauma, and then he comes back into my life. Yeah. Um, yeah. I Not think... saying he does come back, you know, but, yeah. Well, yeah, that's kind of the... I think it's The implied. goal of the book, yeah. I think the, it's implied. The, the goal of the mission of the book. Mm -hmm. um, have you ever written anything that has come to fruition, oddly enough, like, before... Like, your book kind of, you wrote that before you knew that you were going to reconnect and then it happened. Like, mm. has that ever happened before? Um, trying to think. I think so. I think, you know, sometimes I'll write about, actually, I will say this. I did write a Jump Kick article. So I was the co-founder of a satirical crowdfunding website. Um, and we were featured in the Washington Post, and it was a really good experience. This is when I became but, a, aware of Aaron's work oh, for the first time. I was I was a very you. very big fan of oh. the the Jump Kick stuff. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Check it out for those listening at Jump Kick Funding on Instagram, JumpKick.net. But anyway, so I wrote an article about. I wrote like. Oh, we don't call them articles. We call them campaigns. I just remembered. Um, yeah, I wrote a satirical campaign about, like, an ex-boyfriend. Or, or it was some, No, it wasn't. It was just, like, creating a dating app for emotionally unavailable narcissistic men or something. And I had just gotten out of a relationship where it was just awful. And... I needed to process it, so I put everything into that article. And then one of my friends shared it, and then somebody who also dated that person, who I didn't know, um, was like, oh my gosh, that quote is too real. It reminds me of name of person. And then my friend was like, oh shit, like that was about him. And then she followed me. I followed her. We became friends. We, like, talked about, you know, both of our respective traumas from that relationship and helped each other. And I love the women supporting women thing. And now we're, like, each other's close friends list on Instagram. <laughs> so I think that was a healing experience. That kind of satire brought something to fruition. Oh, wow. So, yeah, that was cool. Huh. Yeah. Have you... Uh... Do you always like the groups that you write in? Or oftentimes are you just like sitting in the corner and you're just like what do you taking mean, notes? Groups? Like, uh, like who do you write with? Like, are you oftentimes in classes? <laughs> are you like, you had beta testers? Was that through the organization that published you? Like, no, who do no, you show no. your work to and like workshop with? Yeah, that's a good question. I do have some friends like, uh, I don't know if you know the satire site, uh, the New England satire site, the Boston accent, or um, but I, the founder of that and I are like best friends, so we workshop with each other. I've workshopped with the co-founder of Jump Kick. Uh, I've 
like all my I've met so many satire people from around the world mostly from the hard times but just from the general satire and humor culture so I workshop with my friends from that but and when I I'm not in an MFA in creative writing program now but I'm gonna do it next year um assuming I get in hopefully I get in um but when I was in undergrad, I was an English creative writing major. So, but a lot of the times in any of my classes, writing or not, I'd just be scribbling. And I did that in high school too. Um, and I was, you could tell I was not taking notes that I was writing something else because I wouldn't be scribbling so fast. Um, if that were, if I was just taking notes on a teacher talking or a professor talking slowly about something. Um, but yeah, but generally I like to write by myself. I'll go to people for feedback, but I like to do it on my own. But I do love the structure of like a, uh, like English or creative writing class where you get to workshop with other people. So I'm really, that's very fulfilling to me and I'm looking forward to getting back into it. I know there's like satire and writing classes around New York City, but I want to do them so bad. Um, but I can't afford it. Yeah. Yeah. Like any comedy class or improv class or whatever is very expensive. Yeah. So I just can't swing that. Yeah, because they're us in the future. They're yeah. Just, they're, they're just us when we're like, okay, now we've done this a really long time and we haven't made money. <laughs> no, no, to, no. I don't think I don't money. think that about the the like people running it. I think the people running it are really great. But I mean, like. <clears throat> they're always run by I just mean the nature of the arts I didn't mean oh okay yeah. Yeah, yeah just in general the arts you get underpaid for everything <laughs> oh no that's true but like um, it would be like somewhere at the pit or UCB yeah. or, or something like that that charges a lot of money so that's why um, I'm gonna apply to a fully funded creative writing program so if I get into that I'll have that experience again of workshopping with other people in a very structured environment so that'll be free if I get in. Um, but yeah, classes are expensive, but I generally do like to write alone. That's my long-winded answer. Nice. Um, <clears throat> you moved to New York City before the pandemic, right? No, I okay. actually moved um, tw April 2021, like two weeks after I got my vaccine. I just oh, wanted wow. to get out of my parents' house so bad cool. and, and like, do comedy and I kind of started grinding at open mics and you know shows and I just exhausted myself doing that <laughs> so then that's why satire is more of my uh passion word yeah very cool yeah um do you like who do you like to read now are there any f fiction writers that you uh specifically enjoy well I hate saying this but I'm more of a writer than a reader like, I, I agree with the statement. I somewhat agree with the statement of, like, good writers read. But actually, no, I don't agree with that statement at all. I think that it can help you, and I think it's important. But I don't think the saying, like, good writers read is completely true. Hmm. And I think, I honestly do think reading Raymond Carver and Henry James and Tobias Wolf and other people really did help me. Um, but I don't think it's necessary. I think... I personally, I have ADHD. My best friend has dyslexia. Neither of us read for those reasons. Like, and she's an amazing writer. She's a lyricist. She's like one of the best writers I know. So I, yeah, I have not been reading as much as I'd like to say. Um, and I also just graduated from grad school. So the reading I was doing was academic and I just did not have time to yeah. read on my own. But I stare at my my little, uh, I have a wicker basket of books, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to read some of them. I um, started reading How to Write Funny 2, no, How to Write Funnier, which is Scott <laughs> Dickers' second book in his series of How to Write Funny. So I started uh, reading that, and he recommends writing, I think, 20 headlines a day, 10 or 20. So there have been some days where I've actually done that. So, but I'm looking to get back into reading if nice. you have any satire recommendations. Oh yeah, no, I'll definitely think about that. I'm trying to... And I want to get <clears throat> into, my goal this year is to get into McSweeney's or The New Yorker 
So I'm really trying to delve into those pieces just to learn what they like and yeah. what their style is like. Because I've read them before, but I really want to study it now. Cool. What do you like to do uh, when you're not writing? Um, hang out with friends, exercise, and listen to ABBA while doing so. <laughs> I love ABBA, and I watch a lot of TV. Like, I also... That's another thing. I based my book off of, like, inspiration-wise, besides, you know, Raymond Carver writing style. Um, I was a huge Breaking Bad fan, slash still am. So I based a lot of what was in the book, like, cartel stuff, or in this case, it was the triad. But same concept of, like, drugs and, you know, being chased and crime caper, um... And so I based it off of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia and Breaking Bad. So I would... <laughs> if they had a baby. <laughs> yeah. So I, with the absurdity of It's Always Sunny and stuff. Um, and a little bit The Good Place. Um, like, do you know that show? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, but anyway, so I would watch like Breaking Bad, an episode. Then I would watch It's Always Sunny right after. Then I would watch Breaking Bad again. And try and merge the two. I think Breaking Bad, in my opinion, is the best written show um, in the world. And I based it a lot off of that. Because with ADHD, it's so much easier for me to sit back and watch a show than read a book. Just because there's more stimulation and stuff, I think. Um, so yeah, I kind of study TV shows as opposed to books for writing, which sounds maybe weird, but like, I like to, it's easier for me to analyze character development and stuff in TV shows. And actually, fun fact, I used to intern at a talent management agency. Um, have you seen Breaking Bad? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, Agent Gomez, Hank's partner? For sure. Yeah. Yeah. I love Gomi. Um, but actually he was represented by that talent agency and I helped him edit his HBO comedy special, oh, which wow. is called, or it's on HBO and I think it's streaming elsewhere. Um, it's called the new Mexican. And uh. my job was to look at it, suggest where he should cut things, how to, it took days to do because like, it's just very meticulous because you have to get the time exactly correct. So like, you have to say, like, cut from 0, 0, 31 to mm -hmm. zero zero thirty four. It's just very meticulous. And it was a really good special, so I'm not saying that. But, yeah, that's a fun fact. But long-winded answer <clears throat> is I used... That is a very used, fun fact. Yeah, I used Breaking Bad and It's Always Sunny as main influences for the book. Do you ever write a screenplay format and try to write TV shows? I've tried and I want to, but it doesn't come naturally to me for some reason, which I know is not an excuse, but I kind of just don't like writing in that format. Um, and also oh, another thing is I'm a type one diabetic, so I do need health insurance. So in theory, it would be a dream to get good at screenwriting and like be in a writer's room of, um, you know, people and write for an NBC show or something. But with that I don't know what's going on with I know there's a lot going on with the union right now and fighting for writers and actors rights but I think the way it works is that after the show ends or if the show gets canceled which you can't predict I think all your health insurance ends too so as a diabetic I can't really take that risk of like if I were to write a pilot I wouldn't be able to work on it do you know what I mean for sure, like if no. It was a show. Uh, yeah, I'm a big, big fan of uh, single payer healthcare and Medicare yeah. for all, just yeah. for these reasons. Because yeah, yeah, people's lives shouldn't be dictated whether or not they keep a job for a long time. But yeah, mm -hmm. it is. It is like that. It's it's more like a minimum thing. Yeah. So you would have to get into the union, and then you'd have to make a certain amount of money, most likely. I'm right. pretty sure that's at least that's how it works for SAG. Yeah. Because uh, I am on strike this really? Labor Day. Yes. Now. Do you do, oh, do you yeah. do TV writing or anything? I don't do TV writing yet. Um, would love to if somebody has a TV show they want me to write on, but uh, I'm currently in the Screen Actors Guild. That is my oh. my union. Yeah. So do you do acting? I do. I do oh, act. Nice. Yeah. Um, outside of the 
the stand-up, or perhaps the stand-up will lead to the acting one day. Nice. But Are you represented? I am not represented, so that so is if anybody, the next mission, yeah. Yeah, is the, the representation thing. But it's well, like, if you need help, because I know, sorry I cut you off. No, it's all good. Like, with that um, agency job, I really learned a lot about, like, what the agents want, and, like, so if you ever need advice on a tape or anything like that let me know i appreciate that yeah uh so we're like we're pretty we're pretty deep into this conversation oh, yeah. i feel like you uh you got a lot out yes is there nice. is there like a message you would like to share to the world i'm probably gonna regret the fact that i can't think of one but <laughs> i guess you know keep writing set goals it's hard but if you want to write a book just I don't know, just do it. It's hard. It really is. And it takes everything in you to actually get you to finish it. Um, but yeah, so that is my advice to, uh, to just write. Um, yeah. Nice. Yeah. Well, this was fantastic. Thank you so much, Aaron, for coming out to uh, Rutherford, New Jersey. I know it's yeah. tough to uh, cross the Hudson River for some people, uh, but yeah. I appreciate you coming out here this and is a great uh, space. doing the podcast. Uh, you can catch the Lobster Heist on Amazon, but if you want to not support the devil, where can <laughs> they get it? Is there uh, another place outside of Amazon, or is it just Amazon right it now? It is just Amazon right now. There's sure. Humorous Books does have a page for it and there should there's a bookshop link um but it's not set up yet but maybe in the future it will um, yeah maybe by the time they're listening to this it'll be yeah who knows, who knows yeah. when they're listening but i guess for now just get it on amazon uh i know we're supporting something i mean amazon is not a great company but yeah um can i plug my socials and stuff you could plug everything okay, yes we you. would love to yeah so so we're the book is published by Humorist Books, so follow at Humorist Books. Could you tell me a little bit more about that company? Because me as a writer and me as a reader don't know anything about them. Like, do they yeah. uh, publish a lot? Uh, is it, yeah. like, pretty boutique? Like, Yeah, no, it's an indie publishing company. Um, it's an offshoot of... It's within Humorist Media, which also, it encompasses a lot, but Weekly Humorist is the satire um, humor publication that Marty Dundix, the CEO of Humorous Media, runs. Um, so Humorous Books is like an offshoot or a sub-brand, I guess. Um, I don't know the legal business terms. But yeah, they're open for submissions now. Cool. So anybody who wants to submit, I think. I saw it like a month ago, but hopefully. Uh, so anybody who wants to submit to that. So Humorous Books is great, so follow them at Weekly Humorist. Follow at we wait follow them at humorist books then follow at weekly humorist and then you can follow me at at erin e-r-i-n mick laughs so erin mick laughs m-c-l-a-u-g-h-s so nice yeah. and when you make the audiobook hit me up for josh now <laughs> <laughs> yeah thank you no it was a really great book and i'm really glad you came out here um thank you thank you so much follow her on everything give her book a lot of support give it a yes. read uh it's not like it's a quick read but like it is a substantial quick read yeah. like it's definitely something Thanks. that you could like binge on a uh, flight to australia Thank um, you. But it's 197 pages. Weirdly, in Microsoft Word, it was like 230. Huh. But I guess when it's laid out in a book, it turns different. Turns different. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Totally cool that you came on. Uh, if you Thank guys are you. looking for more uh, shows, lnhstudios.com slash shows. I don't currently have any coming up, but I hope to change that in the next couple of weeks once my schedule becomes clearer. Love you all. Thank you guys for supporting. Keep subscribing and whatever the F. Uh, have a great <laughs> life. You too. I mean, <laughs> them too. <laughs> Thank you.